Episode 37, Why Universal Life is Not Right for Infinite Banking. Hi, everybody. This is John Montoya. And this is John Parings. We're authorized infinite banking practitioners and hosts of the fifth edition. Welcome to uh, this episode of the fifth edition. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about universal life and why IBC advocates for the use of whole life instead of universal life. We'll talk a little bit about universal policies, what they are and how they're different from whole life. Talk about some pros and cons of universal life. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, trade-offs and maybe fallout that is possibly seen when using universal policies, especially when it comes to trying to use them with infinite banking. So let's kick this off. And John, what are your initial thoughts on universal life and why we use whole life with infinite banking? Well, right off the bat, you say, what are my thoughts? And I think that's the key word there, thoughts, how we think, and our mindset with what we're looking to accomplish pretty much points us in the direction that we want to have a place for money where we have total control over our capital. And if we look at how a whole life policy is created, how it's engineered to work over the life of the contract, and you compare it to a universal policy, we see that with a whole life policy, we absolutely do have the most guarantees possible. We have the ability to access our capital without any restrictions. So as that cash value builds up, there's no surrender penalties. So I think really the starting point for me is mindset, how we think, what we're trying to accomplish. And if we truly take the time to understand what infinite banking is all about, regaining that control back from traditional banks, we want to put ourselves in the best possible position to do that. Well, we can only do that if we have a whole life policy. And we've talked about it in previous episodes, even if it's not quote unquote, a IBC designed whole life policy, even a traditional whole life policy will eventually create capital, that cash value that you can use for the banking function. But we really need to take the time to understand why we're getting, why we're utilizing infinite banking as part of our overall financial plan. So I think we start with mindset first and foremost. Absolutely. I like that. It does start with our thinking. And I think it's important to point out that in the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, Nelson Nash points out that infinite banking is a process, not a product. And so you technically, you can do infinite banking with anything. You can do it with a savings account. But if you're going to introduce life insurance into the equation, do you want to have a life insurance policy that has guarantees or do you want to have a life insurance policy where you're not quite sure what's going, going to happen with that policy over the years? And that's really, I think, the crux of the matter is that when we get into the universal products, it's often pitched that universal life, you can get better cash value accumulation or higher death benefit for lower cash value. But you know, one of the quotes that I learned from Todd Langford, who learned it from his uh, mentor, is that there are no deals in the insurance industry. And so everything is a trade-off between cost and risk. And so how is it that universal life is able to provide tech, supposedly a higher uh, return on cash value or a higher death benefit? And that the, the end result is that there is some risk in some way, shape, or form that is transferred back onto the policy owner, whereas whole life has everything kind of baked into the product, so to speak. John Montoya had some pretty good ideas or uh, talking points on how universal life is different from whole life. And you had some interesting ideas about, I mean, UL really hasn't even been around that long, right, John? Well, it hasn't. I mean, it was created by E.F. Hutton, I think, in the 
early 1980s, maybe late 70s. E.F. Hutton, of course, is not even around. So I guess when people were, or when he was talking, not enough people listened. I I don't know what the story with that is. But even before we get into the history, um, I just want to go back one step to finish off on mindset, because I know the people that initially get into these policies, universal policies, they're coming from a mindset where they're chasing return, or at least they've been conditioned by Wall Street and their 401k accounts to chase rate of return. And so they come into these life insurance policies thinking, oh, well, there's a death benefit component. I like that. But I also want to try to maximize the returns as much as possible. And that's completely the wrong mindset when it comes to IBC, because IBC is not about chasing rate of return. There, there, there's no possible way that a life insurance product is going to outpace an investment. And so we really have to understand the difference between investments and contracts, first and foremost. And going beyond that, we also have to get out of the mindset, the Wall Street mindset, of chasing rate of return because infinite banking is not about the return on your money. It's the return of your money. You want to always know that you have a safe place where you're going to grow your capital, have access to it at any point, and also be able to use it without interrupting the growth. So it's a completely different mindset that we need to get straight if you're going to really understand and practice IBC effectively. So I wanted to just finish with that real quickly on mindset. Yeah, definitely. That's good. So going back to now the history of UL, and like I mentioned, it's been around for maybe 40 years at this point. And so it's kind of like an experiment that keeps on getting improvised, trying to tweak it and make it better than before. Originally, there was universal life policies, and then from universal life policies, there was created variable universal policies, basically which allows market returns within a universal policy. And since that hasn't performed all that great for the majority of people that's owned them, well, the life insurance industry in trying to sell as much life insurance as possible and make it as appealing as possible, well, they came up with the idea of, well, why don't we try to continue to sell the sizzle of those upside returns in the market, but now with no downside? And so we had the creation of Index Universal Life, I believe in 1997. And they actually have been selling really well. I think in some years, maybe outselling whole life. And really what people are buying is the sizzle, right? They're being sold on hypothetically what these policies can do with their market-based returns. And they love having that floor of no downside risk. But what we see as really unfortunate is that they're stuck in that mindset still of chasing rate of return And then they're not being properly educated on what's actually happening underneath the hood. They have no idea how a UL chassis is set up and how it separates itself, how it's different than a whole life chassis. So I'll throw it back to you. Maybe you can explain how a whole life policy is different from a cost structure compared to a universal life policy and why, for that reason, infinite banking advocates only the use of whole life for this concept. Yeah. And I think a really easy way to think about it, and, and this comes from Bob Murphy, one of the board members of the Nelson Nash Institute and, and one of the people responsible for creating the training materials in the infinite banking, authorized infinite banking program. He talks about whole life insurance as essentially a 121 year term policy, or a better way to say it, since whole life insurance will endow at age 121, He kind of talks about thinking of the premiums. If you're, let's say you're 70 years old, and that means that you have a 51 year term policy, right? Hopefully I did that math right. And and so it's kind of like thinking of a level term policy, but that lasts a long time. And the reason that's important to think about it that way is that 
with a level term policy, we don't expect our premiums don't go up. We just have this death benefit and we have a level term premium payment. Well, with whole life insurance, it's very much the same thing where we have this level premium payment, but it's just structured differently where all the costs are baked in, all the returns that are shown on an illustration or net of all the costs, commissions, all that stuff. And you have this uh, premium payment that you're just going to pay until whenever you stop. And the policy will keep going till you're 121 years old. And if you happen to make that long, the policy will endow. That's how it's different from a term policy. But you can almost think of it as a really long term policy where all the costs are baked in. Universal products, on the other hand, are actually based on annually renewable term. So, and the word to pay attention to there is renewing, renewable, because the chassis of a universal life uh, policy is built on this annually renewing term that renews every year. And what that means is the insurance company renews the term policy for, for that year. And so essentially what that means is then we don't know what the costs are going to be year to year because the insurance company determines what those are going to be for that year. And now there are some maximums that it can go up to, but the, the reality is we just don't know we don't know what those costs will be up to the max. And if you actually look at the maximums in the contract, they're very, very high. And so some, sometimes people will say, well, the, we, we wouldn't expect those to go to the max. And to that, I would say, well, then why is it in the contract? And then the other side of it is we would say that those costs, those increasing costs as time goes on are sometimes can be offset by the net amount at risk, which lowers as you get older. But the thing is, we just don't know what that's going to come out to be in the wash. And so those are really, I think, the basic fundamental points of UL versus whole life. And we're not here to like necessarily bash universal life, but what we are saying is that it's the these are the reasons why it's not appropriate for infinite banking because you're taking a product that's supposed to transfer risk and provide guarantees and you're now reassuming some of that risk in the form of unknown future costs, and we just don't know what's going to happen. And that's not an appropriate place for people to warehouse their capital. Right. We want to remove all the, the risk as much as possible. That way we create a warehouse for wealth that is going to work long-term and contract, contractually will work long-term. Well, that can only happen with a whole life policy. There's an analogy that I like to use to help people understand the difference between whole life and any type of universal life contract. And it's an analogy that is mortgage related. Now, if you've ever owned a home, currently own a home, and you've gone shopping for a mortgage, you're likely familiar with how a 30-year fixed mortgage works. You lock in an interest rate, and that interest rate is locked for the life of that mortgage. Now that is one option. Another option, which was very popular in the mid 2000s, was buying a, an adjustable rate mortgage. Whether that adjustable rate mortgage was fixed for two years, three years, five years, 10 years, what happened is that these people bought these arms, adjustable rate mortgages, fixed for an initial period of three, four, five, 10 years. And then what happens after that initial fixed period? Well, they got the wake up call and the, the notices that those rates were starting to jump. And what happened to the affordability on those mortgages? They vanished pretty much overnight. And we all know what happened with the real estate market in, in that meltdown from 2007 to 2009. Big reason why? because of those adjustable rate mortgages. So bring it all back to whole life versus universal life. When you buy a whole life policy, you are locking in your cost of insurance. That premium is guaranteed never to increase on you for the life of the contract. Not so with a universal life. A universal life is very much like that adjustable rate mortgage, but instead of having it fixed for three, four, five, or even 10 years, what you're essentially buying is a one-year adjustable rate mortgage that's going to renew at a higher cost. And this is guaranteed that cost will increase from year to year. And the older you get, 
the the more that cost grows exponentially. So if you can imagine, if you can kind of see it, right, you have these rising step up in um, costs every single year. And what happens when you get into your 60s, 70s, you're closer to mortality. Well, the costs in those universal life policies are going to rise exponentially. Now, that's going to create a huge dilemma for you if you have these policies, and they have, because what's going to happen? The insurance company has to collect that cost of insurance, and they're either going to take it from the cash value, or they're going to send you a bill and say, hey, you got a premium due. Here's what it is. And that's a horrible predicament to be in, and that simply won't happen with a whole life policy. Yeah. And at, towards the end of this episode, we'll get into a, an actual case that I've been dealing with recently regarding very large premiums that are due on a universal type policy. Let's jump into some pros and cons. And that'll and as we go through that, it'll sort of flesh out some of the details around what we're talking about here. And there are some pros to universal life that end up sometimes maybe being a con, just depending on how you actually end up handling the pro. But the first one is that it's flexible. You do have a flexible, a more flexible premium that you can pay on a universal type product. And so a lot of times it's, again, it's sort of sold as a, a, a lower premium for the same of same amount of death benefit, which how do you do that? And, and then you have the ability to pay higher or lower amounts of premium based on what's going on in your life. Another tacking onto that is the cost is cheaper up front. And as John mentioned, you may end up paying for that in the end. And then the third pro is that it sometimes they say it outperforms whole life. What the the way that they kind of pitch universal products is especially the new indexed universal products, which again have only been around for 24, 25 years. They say that it can outperform where you can you can take advantage of the ups of the market and and not take not partake in any of the risks. And what that means is they'll say there's a, a 0% floor, and then you can get up to a, a cap where you can participate in market upturns. So you can participate in market upturns, but don't take any of the downside risk. And there's, by the way, a lot of fine print to how that works. So, so if you're looking at UL, make sure you understand that. But does it really outperform whole life? And it's kind of a big made. There's some pretty interesting videos out there. There's a actuary called Bobby Samuelson. And he has some pretty interesting stuff uh, regarding IUL, where he was kind of saying that these policies are constructed, meaning the life insurance pol- the life insurance companies construct these policies to be 200 basis points above prevailing interest rates. And it's kind of interesting where it's kind of like w- what the way Bobby describes it is like, well, if it's as easy as just constructing a product to be 200 basis points above interest, prevailing interest rates, why stop at 200 points? Why not construct it for 400 or 600 above prevailing interest rates? And it kind of points out is that the reality is the the insurance companies don't really know what's going to happen. They don't know if it's going to be 200 points above prevailing interest rates because the longest we can go back is 1997. So we don't really have a lot of the enforced data that we need to to show what's really going to happen with these policies. The other thing is when he talks about it, the, the index ULs, or the policy charges are higher. And so he talks about maybe you can calculate this as 100 basis points over current assumption, but that's about it. And then John, you had something about, you. we were talking about some living benefits as a, a pro to UL? Yeah, well, there's a number of IUL policies that get sold and people really love the idea of the chronic illness rider and other so-called living benefits that are av- available within these policies. And they they get pitched to the point where people start to buy these policies because it does all these things, and it just gets away from, well, why are you doing it in the first place? Because if you're, if an advisor is talking to you about IBC and they're pitching you a UL and they're talking about all these additional benefits that you get, you're kind of missing the, the bigger picture of what IBC is all about and the reason why you're doing IBC. It's great to have these additional benefits, but the whole point of IBC is to warehouse your capital, to take back control of the banking function. So people will get a little bit, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they they're just, they just, they get goo-goo eyes over the additional benefits. 
and it takes them further away from the the main reason and what they should be looking for in the proper type of policy for IBC. And I, I want to throw that out there because living benefits are great, but let's get real. Let's really focus in on what you're trying to accomplish here. And not only that, I'll add this as well. If the policy has the potential to blow up on you later on in life, well, right. what good are those living benefits are going to be? What, what good will those living benefits be if you no longer even have a policy? That's such a good point. And I love goo goo eyes. So talking about goo goo eyes, you know, that's people also get goo goo eyes over the so-called flexibility of the premium. But if we jump into some of the cons of universal life insurance, that flexible premium is actually one of the things that will cause a universal life policy to blow up in the future. And if you look at some of the lawsuits in New York State, places like that, people think that they can just pay whatever they want into these policies and they end up taking advantage of the flexible nature of the premium and they pay the minimum. They pay much less than what's scheduled. And what happens is the costs, because they're not putting those, paying those premiums, the costs end up just completely eating up the cash value and then causing the pol- eventually causing the policy to lapse. And so you get these people that are now 30, 40 years into a universal policy and they find they, their policy is going to lapse or they're going to have to pay a huge premium payment to keep it in force. And th- none of that stuff is planned for. And so the, I think a lot of the benefits, just to use your term, goo goo eyes again, just a lot of those benefits are you might want to take the sunglasses off and and take a closer look at at what's going on. And be, before we get into the next con too, I just want to add, we're talking about the flexibility of UL and the premiums. Well, if you have a properly designed whole life policy with that paid up addition writer, that paid up addition writer is optional. It's very flexible. You don't have to, or you're not required to fund the paid up addition writer of course, when you do, you immediately capitalize the policy, but that writer in a whole life policy can make a whole life policy almost as flexible, if not completely as flexible to a universal life policy that's designed in a similar manner to maybe a whole life that's done for IBC purposes. So I want to let people know that, look, there is flexibility in a whole life policy. You've probably heard otherwise because maybe you're listening to a financial entertainer who is talking about a traditional whole life policy that does not include a a paid up additions writer. But if you do have a whole life policy with a PUA writer built into it, you're going to have every bit as much as flexibility but without the downside risk that you carry with a universal life policy. So I just had to throw that in there real quick. Such a good point. I mean, there's a ton of flexibility in a a whole life policy, especially when a PUA rider is used. There's flexibility in how much you pay. There's flexibility in how long you pay. You can make all kinds of decisions in the future uh, to determine how much and and how long you're going to pay premium in a whole life policy. So that's a great thing to to talk about. You mentioned surrender penalties as something that people aren't typically aware of, and at least in the outset when they're analyzing different types of life insurance. Yeah. So I'll have conversations with people typically for the first time where, you know, we discuss what type of life insurance they currently have. And in a lot of these conversations, people will have to pause and think about what type of whole life policy that they have, or I'm sorry, what type of life insurance policy that they have. And they come to the conclusion, oh, you know what? I've got a whole life policy. And so I'll dig a little bit deeper and I'll ask them, okay, great. Well, what, what's your cash value? And they'll pull up the paperwork and they say, oh, well, the, the cash value is this, but there's a surrender penalty. And that's like a huge flashing neon light that, well, if you've got your cash value, but the surrender penalty is less than what your cash value is, you don't have a whole life policy. You have a universal life policy because a whole life policy does not have any type of surrender penalty. So there's no restriction on your cash values 
ever, whatever your available cash value is in a whole life policy, that's how much pretty much you can access. I I know some carriers will restrict the cash value from maybe 85% all the way up to as high as 99% in some cases, but there are no surrender penalties if you cancel that policy. Not so with a UL policy where you have these surrender penalties baked into the contract language. So if you want to take a policy loan in the early years, Now you're faced with these restrictions where you can't get at a good portion of your cash value for banking purposes. And remember, we're talking about IBC here. Why are you listening to the show? Because you want to learn more about IBC. Well, here's a benefit for everyone who's listening, why they want whole life. You don't have those surrender penalties and restrictions keeping you from accessing your cash value, but you will if you have a UL policy. So with that said, I do want to say that there are products, UL products that have come out in recent years where the life insurance companies have realized that their policyholders do want to access policy loans sooner. And so they have made it available where they will eliminate the surrender penalty or restriction on those policies, but you have to pay a fee in order to have that waived. So as you were mentioning, John, trade-offs, right? Well, here's another trade-off. You want that UL and you want to have more access to the cash value? Well, you're going to have to pay for it. With a whole life policy, you won't. And to to wrap up the con section, we have three more bullet points, but I think they all sort of fall under what we would call the burden of performance. And with a whole life insurance policy, the burden of performance, it's a transfer of risk from the policy owner onto the insurance company. And so the burden of performance falls onto the insurance company. And there is some of that happens with a UL policy, but more and more as the costs increase and we have a longer runway of future unknowns, the burden of performance starts to fall back onto the policy owner when it comes to universal type policies. And that happens in a couple of ways. One is the, again, the risk of unknown where UL and especially now IUL type products, performance is tied to an IUL case, it's tied to a market index, right? Well, there's a big difference between how a UL product is illustrated where they're going to take averages They're going to take an average of market performance and illustrate what that would do in any given year versus the actual of what's going to happen because, of course, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And that can create some pretty significant risks to the policy owner depending on the timing of when they're doing other things like either taking withdrawals, paying lower premiums, or using policy loans. If you have a year or even two years where you get a zero uh, percent crediting to, to the policy cash value, well, that can make a really big difference over the long term of that policy. And then, of course, we have the cost increases, which we talked about earlier, since it's based on annually renewing term insurance, those costs continue to go up and up. And John mentioned the analogy of a fixed versus adjustable mortgage. And so I think the question comes to, I'm sorry, I have one more thing to talk about from the risk of unknown. One really important thing to understand is that universal products do not endow like a whole life product does. And so what that means is they're going, there's going to be some, there's going to be some point where the, the policy will lapse because you've just attained a certain age. The policy does not endow past a certain age, whereas whole life is guaranteed to endow at age 120 or 121 or whatever the age is for for that policy. And so what that means is it's possible to outlive your whole life insurance policy. And again, I'll I'll talk a little bit about that. But the, the other thing that John had some interesting things to talk about was how the viatical industry popped up around UL because of this no endowment feature, so to speak, of a UL policy. Right. Basically what What's happened in the last 40 years since UL policies were created is that you've had seniors who could, who can no longer afford the premiums on their universal life policies, and they've reached the proverbial fork in the road where they have to decide, should they surrender the 
remaining cash value in their policy and walk away. Or here's another option, potentially sell it to an outside investor who's willing to take on the premium and potentially they're, what they're doing is the investor is buying these policies for the death benefit. And what that really means is you, you really have to be certified in some way you're going to pass in the next three to five years to even make uh, your universal life policy a worthwhile investment because the investor pretty much knows that they're going to cover the premium for three to five years, ideally less. And the payoff is that death benefit. Well, that didn't exist. This marketplace for investors to buy life insurance policies from seniors, it didn't invent it didn't exist until the creation of universal life policies. So that's something that really shocks a lot of people. And I think if you're shopping for life insurance and you realize that there's the potential that you're buying a product where the transfer of risk is all on you, you haven't transferred to the life insurance company, you have to realize you could be facing that proverbial fork in the road when you get to your 70s, 80s. If that policy hasn't performed as it was expected when you bought the policy, you're going to be stuck choosing between option A, surrendering the policy, or option B, if you can, sell it to an outside investor and try to recruit a little bit above what your surrender value is. Either way, you're going to walk away with no legacy for your beneficiaries. And if that's important to you, man, that's a horrible predicament to be in. And that just doesn't happen with a whole life policy. The This marketplace that exists now, what they're doing is they're buying up universal life policies that seniors can no longer afford. It's just a sad, sad uh, state of affairs for seniors. And I think it's a black eye on the life insurance industry because they uh, built these products so that people would buy more life insurance. And what's the end result? I mean, the beneficiaries, the people that who were supposed to receive these death benefits aren't receiving them. And that's just sad. And it gets back to why we talk about infinite banking as a process and why do we use whole life in the first place? It's because whole life insurance happens to have some features and functionality that make it optimal for infinite banking. And, and where do those come from? They come from the actuarial guarantees of whole life insurance. And so when we go back to these UL policies that you can outlive, it gets back to this sort of older way of planning where you pick a mortality age and you base your plan on that mortality age. So you just say, well, I guess I probably won't live past age 95. And so I'll just base all my, all my stuff on that. And it's like, well, what happens if you make it past 95? And so I'll get into this kind of case study that I'm talking about right now, where or I'm working on right now, where I was kind of uh, transferred uh, a policy owner who had some questions about his UL policy. His original agent is no longer in business or no longer around. And so the, the insurance company passed it to me. And the way that this policy is structured, this guy is 90, 92 uh, years old, and he has a universal life policy. That's actually a second to die policy, which what that means is both he and his wife have to pass away for the death benefit to be paid out. And this particular UL policy does have a, a no lapse guarantee and a significant death benefit. He, this person paid in several hundred thousand dollars as a one-time lump sum payment into the policy. But now as the policy has aged, there's zero cash value, but he has this no lapse guarantee with a very sizable death benefit. But this no lapse guarantee only goes to age 95. And so now here this family is with an, a 92-year-old policy owner and insured who's in great health at 92. And for all signs, would prob is probably going to outlive this 95-year-old cutoff point. And so now they're at this point where they have to determine, do we want to just let this $2 million death benefit go or do we want to pay an $80,000 a year premium to keep the policy in force to age 100. Again, we can't even, 
we can't even create a situation with this particular policy where it guarantees a payout. He has to die before the attained ages. And so this is this is kind of one of the things that I think is becoming a lot more apparent. And it's a, it's a real problem where people are kind of planning their family's financial future around these products and and they're potentially outliving them. And, and and it's not even that hard to imagine these days to outlive age 95 or even 100. So hopefully the main takeaways that you're getting from this episode is that you really got to do your homework. You have to understand why you're interested in the infinite banking concept. And if you really understand your why, you have the right mindset, you're going to, it's going to lead you to a whole life policy and an authorized practitioner who advocates for the use of a whole life policy. And going beyond that, hopefully you're starting to uh, listen and understand all the pros and cons behind UL and why, you know, we, we really don't advocate for these type of policies. In fact, I don't think we mentioned it so far, but, you know, why was the Infinite Banking Institute even created? You want to touch on that, John? Well, yeah, I think it was created so that they could provide some guidance on just this very thing, like what types of products should be used and the training that goes along with it where, you know, we understand the the macroeconomic principles of how becoming your own banker can help the overall economy, how becoming your own banker can help your personal and, and family economy, and then how can you implement those things? And that's really to, if you're going to create a system, you have to create some guidelines around it and and train the people who are going to implement it. And that's, I think, really why that was developed. Yeah. And I'll say it in a different way. There are too many advisors out there who are taking the infinite banking idea and using the name infinite banking and completely bastardizing it with the use of universal life. And I think Nelson pretty much got fed up with that. And that's where the idea for the Institute came about. I mean, that's still kind of happening to a certain degree, right? Yeah, you, it does. you get on YouTube and, uh, you know, if you look at infinite banking on YouTube, I'd say probably 80 to 90% of those people talking about it aren't authorized infinite banking people. So yeah. So. And, and they may not be talking about you utilizing UL for infinite banking. But what I see in those videos is that they, they still haven't got out of the mindset of chasing rate of return. And so they're talking yep. about the best dividends for life insurance companies and the, mm -hmm. the best cash value. And the mindset is still chasing rate of return, which is really the lowest common denominator that an advisor can go to. And it's kind of disgusting if you ask me, because it, it really shows that those advisors don't understand what IBC is all about. Because again, it's not about chasing returns. It's about having a warehouse for your wealth, a place, what I call a foundation for wealth building. And in that foundation, you want bedrock certainty that what you want to have happen will happen. And yes. there's only one type of policy that will allow that. And that is a whole life policy. And specifically for infinite banking, of course, a properly designed whole life policy that will include that paid up additions writer. And hopefully you're working with an authorized practitioner who knows the ins and outs and can coach you beyond the first policy. Because like I've always said, if you're doing IBC right, you're going to have more than one policy. Nice. I think that wraps up today's episode about universal life and IBC. If you have any questions, you can head over to the fifth and uh, right there you can email us. You can schedule an appointment with us. No, no obligation, 30 minute call. And we can just talk about how any of these strategies could be implemented in your life personally. And then if you're on one of the platforms that has reviews, we sure appreciate a five-star review so we can get this information out to more people. Thanks, John. Always great to talk to you about all these uh, important concepts. Yes, definitely a fun episode for us. And thank you to all the listeners. Really appreciate you listening and sharing our podcast with others. Take care, everyone.